medicine and uh, my experience and expertise is in sales and marketing. I used to be a magazine publisher. Um, I now market and promote and sell uh, magnesium as a supplement, a transdermal supplement, um, because during my research I found that there's a great deficit of magnesium, um, especially in Australia, and um, I was looking for a way to counteract uh, the, um, the deficiencies that were emerging. We have very high levels of deficiency which correlates with high levels of degenerative disease. And when you have low magnesium, you also take in more toxins such as chemicals, pesticides, heavy metals and other chemicals. And the body then kind of eliminate those toxins because it doesn't have sufficient magnesium. So magnesium is clearly an essential uh, mineral that the body cannot survive without. And so that's what I do at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. What are your views on mandatory water fluoridation and how have you been involved in recent years in the battle against this measure in Queensland? My view on uh, mandatory water fluoridation is that we're, um, without people's full informed consent, dosing them with a drug, uh, with a chemical with severe side effects, it causes systemic poisoning and the argument that, oh, it's only low and it's in small traces doesn't really wash because fluoride is cumulative. Once you dump it into the main drinking water supply, it ends up in the food supply and it's multiplied many times. You have bioaccumulation, so no one is measuring how much fluoride is being consumed. No one knows how much water people drink on average. No one knows how much water people who sweat a lot drink, how much water athletes drink. Then there's food, pharmaceuticals. Fluoride has now uh, infiltrated most things that we consume. We're exposed to huge amounts. And fluoride is used in, in fertilizers as well. So you'll be getting it from the foods, from supermarket foods and packaged foods in particular. So we now have something in our food supply which is not being controlled or monitored in any way, which severely affects people's health. And to me, that's a big concern uh, because it causes unnecessarily, unnecessary pressure on the health system. People are getting sick. Uh, we can't afford to pay for an escalation in, in diseases and health issues. The Medicare system can't afford to pay for it. And on its current trajectory, it's going to get worse and worse because nothing's been done about it. Uh, where the breaking point is going to be, I don't know. But it's in the future and it's coming and it's going to be big. Um, I don't think uh, we have a shortage of chemicals out there as it is. We don't need to put extra fluoride in the water, which is a known carcinogen. Fluoride will rob your magnesium and magnesium is essential for life. Fluoride and magnesium interact, they are antagonists. So when they meet, they bind. And if you have low magnesium to start with because you're not getting enough from the food, the fluoride will bind with the little bit you do have and will prevent you from uptaking it sufficiently. And low magnesium is carcinogenic because it interferes with the DNA bonding. That the DNA can't repair its links without magnesium. And this has been proven in many studies. Um, I just want to read to you on the cancer issue from the University of Athens study. The role of magnesium in DNA stabilization is concentration dependent. At high concentration, there is an accumulation of magnesium binding, which induces conformational changes leading to ZDNA. While at low concentration, there is deficiency and destabilization of DNA. The biological and clinical consequences of abnormal concentrations are DNA cleavage leading to diseases and cancer. Carcinogenesis and cell growth are also magnesium ion concentration dependent. There you have it. Could you just repeat the name of that study again, please? Uh, that was the Magnesium DNA Interaction Study um, 
authors are Anastas Sokolou and Theophanides from the National Technical University of Athens Chemical Engineering Department. And that was dated uh, 2002. All right. I'll just pull you back a little on the initial question. Uh, how have you personally been involved in recent years in the battle against this measure in Queensland? Well, I started um, uh, researching and the more I looked, the more I was shocked at the weight, the mountain of scientific, very credible scientific evidence from all around the world from studies showing that ingestion of fluoride, chronic ingestion of fluoride, uh, leads to disease, it's highly toxic. Um, it's, it's the same as taking small amounts of arsenic over time. That's how you kill someone. You don't kill someone with a large amount of arsenic very quickly because the body will just expel it very quickly. But if you want to kill someone with arsenic, you give them small amounts over a long period of time so they have small chronic doses. In a very similar sense, fluoride is poisoning us over time because the small doses get in and they stay in the bone particularly if you're magnesium deficient they stay in the body they interfere with enzyme activity i found in my studies that um, fluoride is an enzyme inhibitor and every cell in your body needs enzymes to function so over time you're not only going to hurt your thyroid but the whole endocrine energy system is dependent uh, on this on this enzyme system and that's the reason fluoride has an effect on bacteria because it interferes with the enzymes of the bacteria so when they did the studies on the surface of the teeth and they found it inhibited the bacteria it was the enzyme activity of the bacteria that was affected so how did they jump to the conclusion that if you drink the stuff it's going to help your teeth all it's going to do is interfere with the enzyme activity of every cell in your body. It's a systemic poison. So I felt quite affronted that governments were not looking at the real science behind what was going on. It's not new information. There are numerous studies, but they refuse, point blank, refuse to look at it. Every politician that I spoke to and asked questions of said, well, I don't know enough about it, I'm not an expert, but we give it to the NHMRC and it's their job to tell, if it's, tell us if it's alright. So they said it's alright, so we accept that. And that's the end of it. And then there's a closed door. Hear nothing, say nothing, say nothing. They don't listen to people uh, ringing up, sending letters. They don't listen to any of the process, protests. You don't count. Now why? I asked myself, why is there such a force of money being spent to force fluoridation when all of the polls done show the majority of people don't want it? Why do they spend so much money in marketing, in campaigning, in advertising, and trying to create a spin that this stuff is somehow good for you? Why do they suppress the information? Why don't they listen to the doctors? In the, um, one of the best sites uh, is in America on, which educates people on the fluoride issues and it's called fluoridealert.org. It's run by a very eminent scientist professor, uh, Dr. Paul Connett, and, uh, and he has um, enlisted the agreement of thousands of other professionals around the planet, scientists, doctors, uh, people of very high ranking um, uh, credibility, all calling for the end to fluoridation. Why don't governments listen? With such a weight of opposition in the scientific community, sounding warning bells, sounding the alarms that we are poisoning ourselves by dosing the water with a drug. And in fact, the EU has classified fluoride now as a drug that can only be sold in a container with a label on it. So how can you put it in the water indiscriminately, overdosing your babies, kidney patients, Aboriginal communities, and many population subgroups which are highly sensitive to the fluoride, much more sensitive than the average, that feel the side effects straight away. They don't have to wait years till they get 
heart disease or osteoporosis or some kind of degeneration. They feel it straight away in the form of an allergy or a skin outburst or an immune system response. Nobody's, nobody cares. The politicians don't care about these subgroups. And what's the NHMRC doing? Years ago, they, they, they actually recommended that further research be done in the toxic effects of fluoride and how much we are ingesting because they agree at high amounts that it's very toxic and is not good for your health. Well, if they agree at high amounts and they can't tell you how much we're consuming, then there's a disconnect there. Surely something's wrong. Something's not being done properly. Who's policing the show? Who's saying to the NHMRC, you're not doing your job properly? Who's out there? Sticking up for the people, the babies. I mean, babies consume per body weight up to four times as much fluid than an adult. They'd be getting four times as much toxin through the system if they're drinking fluoridated formula. Fluoride has been forcibly introduced across water supplies in Queensland. Those who oppose this measure have been touted as medically backwards and part of the Queensland of old by authorities, including the Premier in Anna Bly in Queensland. Are people medically backward if they oppose water fluoridation? And what about places like Europe? Do they have water fluoridation? Well, Queensland is very interesting because it has actually a history which is upfront, close and personal with fluoride. And in the 60s, uh, farmers in Western Queensland were experiencing a lot of problems with their sheep and cattle and that they had bone deformation and crippling. So the Australian government funded a study to find out what was causing the bone deformation and skeletal crippling. And the end of the study concluded that it was the high level of fluoride in the boar water that the animals were consuming. And so Queensland farmers, or the Queensland of old, still have a good memory that fluoride actually isn't very good for us because if it cripples the animals, it's going to cripple the people in high amounts. So their efforts are actually in trying to get the fluoride out of the bore water and to trying to filter that water so the animals aren't exposed to so much fluoride. Uh, city folk, however, will not have had that farming experience, will not have had that memory, and they're very much more influenced by media, by television, by things told to them by other sources. They don't have personal experience with fluoride and what it does, and so it's much easier to deceive people when they don't have all the facts. Uh, I don't know, I don't think all the politicians really understand, most of them have no idea, not even a clue as to the toxic effects of the fluoride. They just repeat what they're supposed to repeat, which is what the party tells them, and they have a party line, and you have to say this, and if you say anything else, you don't get pre-selection for the next election. So this is the kind of pressure that politicians are under. If any of them stick their neck out, if any of them do any extra research, and really understand the gravity of what we're facing here with this poisoning, uh, then they would be ostracized. So they control the system with fear.